Um, <clears throat> good evening. It's evening there. It's morning here. And I'm rather short on sleep, so I must apologize for my appearance and for uh, any possible uh, deficiency in my uh, uh, quick thought process. Um, I'm speaking to you from my, the kitchen of my home, and uh, I, I apologize uh, for not being able to be there with you. I wanted to do that. Uh, however, the uh, press of my work was such that it was not possible. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we're going to be discussing the roots of the social media roots of personal computing. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Ah. So we'll start with the question, what is a personal computer? Is it a sm just simply a small computer? I say no. Uh, it has to have certain other characteristics, a high degree of interactivity for one, and uh, of course capable of being programmed by the users. So, uh, lots of uh, computers are technically in use all around us, but we do not have the opportunity to uh, program them. They are not personal computers. And the uh, an interesting fact, uh, point I'm going to, to discuss in much more detail is that uh, when one sees a personal computer in, act in activity today, um, if you were transported from the 1970s, you would look and see, oh, well, that's a terminal. Where's the computer? And of course, the computer has basically come up through the uh, wire and uh, merged with the terminal to make a personal computer. I want to bring another aspect in. I don't have a slide for this, but um, it's very important. What does one do with a personal computer? Well, we all supposedly know the answer. It's a very useful tool. but. I want to suggest that uh, the salient characteristic of personal computers, as opposed to any other kind, is that they are built and intended to be used for play. Now, I don't mean necessarily playing video games, but that's an important part of it. But I want to point out that a common characteristic throughout all of humanity is sport and play. Uh, we are uh, raised to think of play as something for children, child's play. And of course, as adults, we do not play, except occasionally. But actually, we play much more than we think. Uh, we have uh, and enjoy uh, informal uses of our technology. And we do it for reasons other than productivity. Um, sport, while it's universal again throughout humanity, does not uh, yield economic results. And in the strictly econ economic, pardon me, in the strictly economist terms, uh, it is not remunerative. Of course, it is remunerative in very uh, subjective ways. It uh, provides the experience, or at least the opportunity, to experience mastery, virtuosity, and to show off uh, to uh, one's uh, peers and one's uh, uh, those about you. And one thing to note is that uh, one of the most significant causes of industrial accidents is the tendency to play with the tool or the uh, machine. Uh, if there were a way of making this cease to happen, there are many insurance companies that would be delighted to find out. So as humans, 
we tend to play with our tools. Uh, and uh, pardon me, my voice is not the best this morning. Um, all right, next slide, please. Ah, the Altair 8800, the, the uh, famous, pardon me, I'm trying to change my slides here. Well, that's interesting. This seems to be a different order from the, uh, all right, I'm going to have to wing this one. It seems like we have a, 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 I must have sent a different slide uh, show, but uh, let's go on this one. The uh, Altair 8800, while there were foundations on which a personal computer could be built, I will say were not personal computers because they were in the only very technically or very formally were computers. They had a CPU and they had memory, but the rest of it was not included. You could add it for extra cost and extra effort. Uh, the, a friend of mine, Steve Dompierre, uh, earned fame by being able to uh, add an output channel to the uh, Altair through a radio because of all the noise, the electrical noise that uh, uh, the computer would generate. And uh, he made it uh, produce music. This was demonstrated at the third uh, meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club to great applause. But otherwise, if you wanted to use it for anything else, you had to go shopping. You had to buy a terminal which was not inexpensive in those days. I mean, today, anyone would look at it and say, oh, well, you just hook a computer up to it. Well, really, I mean, it's supposed to be a computer. And so a friend of mine, Bob Marsh, and many other people uh, made a good business designing and building uh, plugins for the, uh, the computer to make it do something. Bob Marsh came running to me almost in, in 1974, holding the popular electronics magazine, which announced the Altair, and saying, look at this, there's nothing in the box. We can make stuff to put in the box. The teletypes, TTY, that they uh, were normally used cost at least $1,000. And they would run at uh, 10 characters per second with an 11-bit word. That's 110 baud. You could buy a, t a CRT for $1,500 to $2,000. And these are, these are dollars uh, 40 years ago, which cost a lot more than dollars today. And it, they would run up to 9,600 baud. And on neither one could you do anything approaching uh, interactive graphics. And of course, worst of all, uh, the computers arrived with only the instruction set that was burned into the CPU. No other software. This led to the famous uh, acquisition of uh, the tape of uh, Altair Basic, which got uh, duplicated and uh, was widely passed around and uh, which led to Microsoft's dominance in the field of languages when, uh, after a few years, a uh, semiconductor company asked Microsoft, or they, they asked their marketing department, what is the most popular basic? The most popular basic was uh, Microsoft. They, they wanted a basic for their chip, and so they went directly to Microsoft. However, Bill Gates didn't see it that way before then. He thought we were thieves. Next slide, please. So the, uh, when, when you got a, uh, an Altair, for instance, you had just begun the process that could be long and uh, troubling of 
learning far more than you needed, thought you needed to learn and spending more than you thought you were going to spend. Uh, so it absorbed you and you were trying to get software that worked and you were trying to get a computer that worked and did something. Now, in let's go back to 1973 because I maintain that this is uh, the uh, opening event of the personal computer revolution. Uh, actually, this should be in reverse order, but since it's, I put it in chronological order. In August 8th of 1973, the first publicly accessible social media terminal opened in Berkeley. And they found that the, the people doing it found a very positive response. Uh, I now say that we opened the door to cyberspace and found that it was his hospitable territory. In September of that year, an article appeared in a uh, sort of second-rate uh, electronic uh, hobbyist magazine and uh, it showed a, a, a what looked to be a terminal a keyboard with a pair of hands coming in to, to uh, view it in my previous the slides that I thought I sent I have a picture of this but I don't think I can show it here well there it is okay um, so I'm, I'm happy that we got the right slide set. Um, see, uh, we see a, a television with uh, letters on the screen typed by those hands. And um, when I asked the author of the piece, Don Lancaster, why he designed this, he said, people just want to put letters up on their TV screen. That's it. Uh, this, I asked him this because we were by that time discovering that this would not work very well as a terminal. We'll go into this a little bit later. But that's what he thought he wanted to provide. Next slide. There we are. Uh, in video production, this, this device would be called a character generator. Um, and it had a two-page display meaning that while you were, you were typing one page and when you reached the last character of the screen, uh, the next character would cause the entire screen to go blank and the first character appear at the upper left-hand corner. Now, you can't use a terminal that way uh, because you don't have time to read that last character before the next one comes in. Another point that became evident uh, later was that the uh, memory chips used for this were sequential access or shift register memory chips. And as their name implies, they store things by, like the bucket brigade passing a bit along from one location inside the chip to the next and eventually that information comes out the chip, but you have to wait. Therefore, uh, a character on the screen could not be changed instantaneously. It had to wait for the entire screen to refresh. Now, that's one sixtieth of a second, but when you start to try to change anything randomly on the screen, you cannot do it. Uh, you're limited to one character every sixtieth of a second at least and for if you wanted to change random characters. To change sequential characters, you can do it quite rapidly. Next screen, next slide. So the uh, article was published as a construction article. And you were to send in uh, $2 and a self-addressed envelope for the plans. A typical response would be 20 responses. They got 10,000 paid responses. That's why I call this the opening event of the personal computer revolution. It indicated very clearly 
uh, that a very large number of people were interested in something that looked like a terminal that they could get a hold of, that they could build. Next slide. Uh, I am uh, very in indebted to uh, Professor Dr. Holtgren uh, for raising the question of time sharing as part of this. Um, the uh, I, I when I heard this, when I read the the, the message. I, I thought to myself, why is he interested in having me talk about time sharing? Now, this was always considered a kind of dead end or peripheral element to personal computing. But having done some thought about it, uh, I can see that it's a very significant part of, of personal computer use because time sharing was the first real application that allowed people to use computers on a personal basis. You weren't using the whole computer. You were using a mainframe in some other city. Uh, but the, the, the user experience was as if you were using your own computer. Uh, and therefore, rather quickly enough, uh, it began to be used by students, first at university and then in, early, in uh, earlier schools in high school. And they began to develop uh, games to use on it. Uh, we'll talk more about somebody who was very uh, Im influential in that area later. The business uses for which the timesharing was developed uh, were slow, and the, certainly <laughs> they would grind to a halt when uh, the afternoon came and all the heavy load got on. I know I experienced this in 1970. Uh, and it's important to tell a little story here that doesn't have a slide for it. Uh, in 1970, uh, for reasons we'll see later, I came to the conclusion that uh, networked computers were going to be important for any system which uh, developed, uh, it was developed for the uh, uh, development and sustain sustenance of community. Uh, and now I came to this conclusion in part because I was sent by my employer at the time to a class to learn uh, to use a time-sharing terminal and to learn to use BASIC. These classes were held at a, an institution called a service bureau. And I don't think we have these today, certainly not for time-sharing. And... Uh, you went to a, a place, a business, where there were young men in tight three-piece suits uh, acting very officious, like they knew everything because that's why they were there and you were there to learn stuff. And we learned to use these uh, electromechanical terminals, IBM Selectrics, and they would proudly talk about you know, things that uh, only they knew. So, for instance, they would say, do you see how the uh, terminal sort of hesitated and then began running more slowly? That's because we've switched off the computer in Los Angeles and are, are now using the computer in Kansas City, which made me understand that uh, on this network of computers, you had uh, location as irrelevant. Anywhere in the network was the same place. Then they said that uh, in BASIC you could uh, organize your files by prepending, by adding in front of the name of the file, one or more asterisks. And the number of asterisks indicated the level of public accessibility of the file. No asterisks, only you could access the file. One, the next level up from your level, could access them all. And so on to three three. Asterisks, anyone using the system could access your file. And that made me realize that uh, communities of interest could be built on a system like that. 
And so I had the uh, realization that we needed a network of computers. And then I sat up and said, but where am I going to get a computer? And of course, only one computer, not a network of computers. Uh, and this was important for what I later did and people did with me. Okay, so timesharing developed in the 1960s and uh, spread in the 1970s, and it seemed to be the way that computers would be used. In fact, uh, there were uh, uh, official serious books about the future of computing uh, written, published by IBM, in effect, and they were saying that uh, it's very clear that people will be using computers in the future through terminals in the home. The computer, of course, will be part of the telephone system because they own the wire to the home and they know how to run a great big computer. So this was to be the future of computing. Next slide, please. However, some things happened. Uh, I had the very good luck to entered the University of California at Berkeley in September of 1963, and a year later, the revolution happened. Now, people don't call it that very much, but uh, I'll talk later about why it's a, actually a revolution and not simply a, a revolt or a, a isolated, it wasn't isolated incident. But we're seeing here that in uh, October of 1964, a three-day standoff in which a crowd surrounded and immobilized a police car that had come to take away a former student who was uh, arrested for uh, being at a, uh, an advocacy table uh, without permission. There was an attempt to suppress the uh, support of the civil rights movement of the time, uh, and the university uh, clamped down on their rules and enforced them very rigorously, at just the time that students, some students who had come back from uh, Mississippi summer, Mississippi Freedom Summer, uh, had gotten back to campus. This set off an explosion. Next slide. So let's see, we can define a revolution. I can define it. Other people define it different ways. As having the following elements, overthrowing an existing order, it involves a large number of people, and it produces unforeseen outcomes. So this was the free speech movement. It's, as its name implies, it was focused very closely on the issue of freedom of speech, the issue of advocacy, and their, their demand was that only the Constitution of the United States governs free speech, uh, political speech, on a public university campus and no more. And it was a coalition, of, a broad coalition from left to right of all the student advocacy groups. What happened that we didn't foresee was that it overthrew the uh, institution, the, the order of in loco parentis. And that, of course, in Latin means in place of the parent, uh, in which the university was expected to uh, perform in, in the role of the parent to the student. It certainly involved mass participation. Uh, 763 people were arrested. I was honored to be one of them at a sit-in at the end of it. And it uh, was actually victorious because uh, the faculty senate voted in favor of uh, changing the rules in accordance with our position. All right, well, that's the limited part of it. The part we didn't expect was it basically kicked off the counterculture. Next slide. And part of that counterculture were switchboards as they eventually developed. They actually, I would say the prototype switchboard was the telephone room at the free speech movement uh, headquarters, which had two phones and a wall. And uh, when somebody came, called in and offered something, either an idea or a project or some resource, uh, it was posted on the wall in a note. It, was, it became a very busy wall there. And people would call in and would have needs, and the people in the phone room would be able to match the needs with the resources, etc. 
that's what switchboards did. And they, they developed later on uh, in nine, around 1967, 68, as the counterculture developed. Uh, and they were community-based volunteer information exchanges. Uh, the technology was simply file cards in a box and a telephone. And the economic basis was never uh, stable. So they would come and go. And even when they were stable as institutions, the people who were maintained the filing system in their heads would come and go. Uh, and now I get around to explaining the, uh, the uh, free speech movement, so I've already done that. Next slide. And here we talk about the, uh, the free speech movement uh, phone room, which I say should be considered the first uh, example of electronically implemented through the phone social media. Uh, next slide, please. The... Uh, Community Memory Project that established the uh, terminal in terminals in Berkeley in uh, 1973 began when three students left uh, the University of California in the midst of the uh, Cambodia crisis and the university restructuring, in which the entire university ground to a halt. And a lot of people decided to do something else. Um, they went to San Francisco. They uh, took over a defunct organization. It was a, a switchboard. Uh, they secured the donation, and this is quite remarkable, of a, an SDS 940 uh, mainframe uh, timesharing computer, one designed for timesharing. Uh, that was a, an epic uh, accomplishment to be able to get, that, to get a hold of that. And they, they did that in part because the uh, university, the uh, nothing to do with the university, the, the San Francisco business establishment by 1970 was trying to figure out what this counterculture phenomenon was. And here was a group that said that we're going to set up a computer for the counterculture. And they, uh, the business folks were willing to put up some money to try to see what happened. It was intended to link the switchboards and uh, consolidate their files. But by the time it was finished, the Rogers Resource One Generalized Information Retrieval System was written, and all of the very hard work was done to get the computer up and running. I, by that time, had joined the project and was uh, the hardware engineer. Uh, they could not get the switchboards of the time even to remember who they were who we were, and uh, not, certainly not pay the costs of renting a uh, teletype, $150 a month. That was far beyond their budget. So the decision was made to just try putting terminals in public to see what happens. Next slide. Well, here's where the quote about cyberspace has hospitable territory comes in. Um, and the important fact was that when people approached the terminal, no one was standing between them and the terminal. We had somebody standing there because it was a teletype and it could jam. Uh, but the uh, keyboard was accessible. So the common comment by the person approaching, and these were all pretty much young people because we set up in a record store in Berkeley. Uh, People approaching would say, oh, oh boy, can I use it? Well, I could have used it, of course. And it was very successful. I think there's a picture here, but let's see. Now, let me, before we go, um, we soon came to the conclusion that we needed basically better terminals at the very least. Also modems, and I worked on that, developed the modem that became the penny whistle modem, in 19, which was sold in 1976. But I also uh, came to understand through reading the works of uh, Ivan Illich, 
um, and his book Tools for Conviviality, that that whatever we did, whatever the terminal was, it had to be have conviviality, meaning it had to sort of invite the user into it in a certain way, into a relationship in which the user explored it. And so I developed the the uh, phrase that a computer in public use must grow a computer club around itself in order to survive. Oh, and there's my little quote about if work is to become play, tools must become toys. That's another bon mot that I made up at the time, and it's a very good one. Next, please. Uh, we don't have the, uh, oh, well, we'll see if you don't have the picture slide. Now a person emerges who is very important, Bob Albrecht. Uh, he uh, was born on a farm, I think in Iowa, and uh, oh, it showed a great aptitude for mathematics uh, when growing up uh, in school. Went on to become a pioneer in uh, computer use by children. And uh, he quickly uh, discovered that BASIC could be used to write games. He wrote some of those games. He published books on the, uh, the uh, uh, process, both technical books, you know, official books, and the book for children called My Computer Understands Me When I Speak BASIC. Uh, he then founded a uh, publication called that was named People's Computer Company, and uh, it was a, in effect, an underground paper. Now that's something that isn't very prevalent today in our social media age, but at that point, when print was the uh, dominant medium, an underground press was one that was open, underground paper open to. It's community. People could come in, propose stories, and be given the opportunity to uh, actually produce those stories, even to the point of laying out uh, on the uh, the photographic layouts. And uh, I, in fact, did this sort of thing because I had been involved in uh, the, the the underground paper of the day, the Berkeley Barb in my search for appropriate media uh, for community development. I, I eventually came to the conclusion that print media was not appropriate. Any medium that was broadcast in nature, that is, that um, emitted the same information to everybody, and that information came through one point, that was not going to be useful for community development. Uh, this uh, underground paper became the focus of a community, which is not unusual, uh, of people interested in what the personal computer might be when it existed, as well as interested in using computers for games. And the same company that published the Whole Earth Catalog published this. So it had very close connections with Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog. And that Whole Earth Catalog was, in fact, uh, advocating that people learn to use technology even if they thought they wanted to get away from technology because you can't get away from technology. Next slide. I see I'm running rather long. This talk may go on beyond its limit. I don't know. Okay. Uh, this is a slide that I should have edited out. Go next. The One of the spin-offs from People's Computer Company, the publication, which, by the way, started in 1972 and lasted until 1976 in that format with Albrecht uh, editing until then. They started in the next door office, the what they called the Community Computer Center. I think they originally called it the People's Computer Center, but there was enough confusion between the names that it got a new name. And it was a gaming center. It was open for kids and anybody to come in, pay 50 cents or something like that, and use time-sharing terminals for gaming and really for anything they wanted to, but that's what they wanted to do. Uh, they held uh, open potluck dinners every week for people who were interested in discussing any aspect of that uh, 
universe. And that became a gathering point for people who, like me, who were interested in the concept of the personal computer and how to do it. And a fellow named Fred Moore, who really was not technically qualified, although it seems uh, that uh, he should have been an engineer, began uh, standing by the doorway and taking people's names and, and contact information, their addresses and so forth. This mailing list, he wanted to do something with it, became this, the mailing list to which the announcement was sent out when the Homebrew Computer Club formed. He was the for person who formed the club. Uh, the Community Computer Center, which moved to a storefront fairly soon in, in, in Menlo Park, California, uh, was run by women. The first was Joanne Kaltnover Plank, who amazed me by coming up to me when I first walked in and saying, are you from Philadelphia? Because her brother had been a high school friend of mine in Philadelphia. Figure that one out. Uh, and later uh, run by Eliza Loop, uh, when they had a PDP-8 to run the time-sharing basic. PDP-8 mini-computer from Digital Equipment Corporation had a four-user uh, time-sharing system that it would run. Next, please. Next slide. The, uh, back to the TV typewriter in 1973. At the first meeting of the Homebrew Club, uh, Steve Wozniak, as we all talked about what we had to bring to the table and what we wanted to do. He had, a, had designed a TV typewriter, which is quite an accomplishment. And uh, he, and I don't know if Steve Jobs was involved at the time, I uh, haven't talked with him about it, intended to sell a cheap terminal to the users of the time-sharing system, call computer that was the favorite of the hackers of the day. Uh, and it became eventually the display section of the Apple One computer. Uh, now, I spoke with Don Lancaster at the time because when I discovered that we could not use the TV typewriter he had designed as a terminal, I asked him, uh, was he going to do anything about this? Well, he told me that he was going to use random access memory in the next version of the TV typewriter. And that started me thinking that if you used random access memory, that's the same type of memory you use in a computer. Uh, and why couldn't you use the same memory? Save some money. In effect, put a window on the memory of, of uh, the, per the, the computer itself and now you had something where you did not have to wait to change data. You could change data instantaneously. I wrote up a specification that I named the Tom Swift Terminal, and there's a story to the name that you know, Tom Swift would be recognized by certainly Americans of my age as a uh, character, a hero of children's books uh, for Cook Street for boys. It was modeled after Tom Edison. He was an inventor and, and invented his way through various stories. Uh, but I will contend, and I'm not necessarily supported by academics on this, only because they've never bothered to, to look into it, uh, that this architecture of the window on memory is fundamental to personal computers. It is how everybody's personal computer display works today. Uh, so I went on to design, I, after the spec, I was able to design an actual device and that was widely copied and I'm very happy for that because that validates it. Next slide, please. So now comes the Altair. This is the cover of that uh, popular electronics magazine. Next slide, please. And it was as if uh, a crystal had been dropped into a supersaturated solution. Uh, okay. Well, I'm quite near the end of the talk, fortunately. 
So when the Altair 8800 arrived, it was not into a neutral environment. Time sharing had prepared uh, thousands, unknown thousands of people for personal use of computers. And there were game software writers who wanted only a much faster graphic device than a teletype. The Trek 73 game, Star Trek, was played on a teletype. If you're lucky, you've got a copy there uh, that somebody's running. But it's rather obscure. And the teletype would very slowly, at 10 characters per second, print out a little grid that was like a tic-tac-toe grid, three by three. And the Enterprise was always in the center square of the grid, and it showed what was in the adjacent uh, eight cells of the grid. And you then, as captain of the Enterprise, took some action depending upon that. And it would slowly print out reports on what the fuel was and things of that sort. Um, the Trek 80 was written by Steve Dompier on the VDM-1 video display module that I was honored to design, which did derive from the Tom Swift terminal, but did not do things the way the spec said. And it allowed lots of things to happen in, in effect instantaneously on the screen. It had an eight by eight grid. <clears throat> we used the, uh, or Dompier used the strange little graphic elements in the character generator uh, chip uh, that were used to represent control character control codes, and so uh, had all kinds of little symbols that could uh, fly about the screen, and uh, the displays running down the side and under the bottom of the screen were all changing instantaneously. It was really something that would absorb any kid. Uh, so this was the quantum leap of accessibility and interactivity that may was made possible by the personal computer with the, the video, uh, the, the memory mapped video. And when the first Altair arrived in Silicon Valley, it was a sample uh, machine that was, I think, serial number eight. Uh, it was sent to per People's Computer Company as a review copy. You know, print something about this, please. Passed around to a number of people. It wound up sitting in a garage in Menlo Park, California on a rainy night, March 5th, 1975, with the people who had been notified of it by Fred Moore and people who had been notified by them, like me, uh, coming, 30 of them came to stand in the garage and look at this, try to figure out what it was and what we could do with it. And we began sharing information at that point. And it was the beginning of the Homebrew Computer Club. Next slide. Now, I've, I've already described that first sentence and explained it. Time sharing set us up for this. Time sharing fostered uh, the development of computer games and the development, uh, the use of computers by students elementary school students, the young, the very young. The environment of the counterculture uh, was based upon a mistrust of hierarchy. Uh, the hierarchy of the university and thousands of uh, students left the university in 1965 after the free speech movement when they sort of realized that they were in the wrong place and they left and uh, founded the uh, Haight-Ashbury community in San Francisco. Uh, and this understanding began to grow of the importance of networked social structures. Uh, the, uh, wait a minute. Time-sharing uses of games, uh, exhibited the power of play. Uh, Bob Albrecht 
in his quest to uh, show that, that uh, students and young people could use computers. Uh, at one point, in, when he was working for, uh, I think it was Control Data Corporation, uh, brought high school students into the display at a computer show. And computer shows in those days were professional events. It was the, the, the organization was very self-conscious that uh, they were fighting for professional status. And uh, here they had, Albrecht had uh, these kids in the booth showing off how easy it was to use those computers. The professional computer organization was not amused by this. And uh, Albrecht caught some, some uh, criticism for this. Uh, so, oh, that's interesting. I to conclude, oh, I see. Next slide, please. Um, social media, which PCC, the, the, the paper newspaper, was a social media because you could be interactive with it by coming in and making your own articles. Community memory was much more interactive because you would do that from the keyboard. But these social media allowed people to find each other. The person who came up to me and notified me of the Homebrew Club meeting, Bob Marsh, contacted me first through community memory. We had been at the same student cooperative in uh, a few years earlier, 10 years earlier. Uh, but here I got a, a message from him saying, I'd like to meet with you. And that became a lifelong uh, friendship. Um, yeah. So I've talked about time sharing uses for games and the uh, bringing together of early adopters. Ed Roberts, who owned the company, Mitz, that made the uh, Altair, thought he owned the entire industry. But we actually owned it. And he had to settle for doing things our way. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to make sure to put up some names here. First of all, the Whole Earth Catalog was extremely important. I did not put down the name of the pub, the, the, the uh, editor of that, Stuart Brand, but his, uh, he's a little bit famous. And that was a catalog of tools initially for the counterculture, for uh, certainly for the uh, people who had gone off to uh, establish intentional communities, communes or whatever in rural areas and thought they were going to live like people lived 100 years ago and they did not take into account that even 100 years ago people used technology. And so Stuart Brand saw that they needed some help with their technology and he started to put together a catalog of things that they could buy if necessary and explain why they were important. You know, if you didn't have electricity where you were, you needed kerosene lamps. And you needed to know a lot about those lamps because they could explode and so forth. And that developed rather quickly into a much more general catalog of everything. And articles by such as uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, who should need no explanation, but uh, put it this way, he was a very radically, radically uh, original thinker and an engineer who could design things that really worked. This included the Dymaxion car from 1933. That's something that you should all look into. I'm not going to explain it all here. But Buckminster Fuller made the point that affected me seriously. In 1980, he was talking, no, 1975, I believe. Somebody asked him, what will the world of the year 2000 be like? To which he replied, we don't need to go think that far ahead. By 1985, all of the decisions that are important will already have been made. And he was speaking to me, in effect, because I was working on this question of what, what and how shall we design uh, personal computers. And so I took that as a very important uh, charge that I was there helping make the future 
and better do some serious thinking about it. E.F. Schumacher was a British economist uh, who in 1974 published a book called Small is Beautiful, in which he introduced the concept of appropriate technology. I'll let that rest where it is because we were doing computers as appropriate technology. Many didn't realize it, but uh, Schumacher laid out a, lot, a number of thoughts about that. Ivan Illich uh, wrote two books that were significant. Deschooling Society proposed a very radical approach in which uh, formal education no longer exists and all education is done informally. Now, I don't go that far, but it's a very interesting book to look at. Uh, and uh, its final chapter, which I would say was very clearly added on at the end, suggests that possibly computers could be used uh, in this process of ma matching people who knew things with people who, who didn't, people who were willing to teach things with people who wanted to learn. And that actually happened in the community memory system within the first month or so of operation. Uh, Tools for Conviviality was a book. That's how I encountered Evan Illich. My, in fact, my father read it first and, and told me about it just at the right time. How does this stuff work? Um, conviviality might be counterposed to, let us say, industriality or industrial. Tools could be convivial or industrial or maybe other things. It's a very small book, and it talked about the process by which uh, people in Central America, which he was studying, uh, learned to uh, fix radios. When radio appeared anywhere in Central America, in very isolated places, within two years there was someone there who could fix the radio. Now, the industrial approach was that you would have to educate these people uh, where the radios were made and send them out and so forth. It would be a very expensive proposition. The convivial approach was the, ra the radios happened to be able to survive exploration by people there. Uh, and that's what happened. They explored it. They found out how to fix it. Uh, presumably, they told each other about it. And that was how I learned about radio and television technology, which was my first technology. So that struck a note with me. Uh, Ivan Illich was talking about how I learned my technology and that this led to this idea that a computer could grow a computer club around itself if it were designed properly. And that was my challenge. And finally, Ted Nelson. Uh, with Computer Lib Dream Machines. Those are two books that were printed back to back. Uh, Dream Machines described computer graphics. Computer Lib described the uh, sort of political and social philosophy of why computers had to be accessible to everyone, why everyone, you know, you can and must understand computers now was the subtitle of that book. Uh, so great honor goes to him for uh, starting us along a path. I know that Steve Dompier, who wrote that uh, the 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 music program and wrote, he was in charge of software for Processor Technology Corporation, the company that started in the garage with Bob Marsh and me. Uh, he was introduced to the uh, to computers in general through that book, and many many other people likewise. Uh, well, okay, that's the end of my formal, formal slides, as formal as this has been, and I can take questions. I, I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but uh, maybe that's later. Dr. Holcren. Some questions right now, or we can do it um, at half past nine, as you said. Uh, it's on you. What do you. What do you think? Me or them? Who are you addressing? <laughs> I think uh, take a look at the audience. Yes, please. <laughs> so, um, perhaps, are there any questions?
Yes, uh, hello. Um, well, thank you for this remembrance of heroic days. And um, two, two short questions. One, why was it called community memory when it was all about presence of communication? And the second question is, you say out of the anti-hierarchical freedom movement arose this community spirit. But didn't it replace what the engineers call the master-slave relation between the mainframe computer and the terminal, which is very hierarchical, I think. What do you say about that? Well, I, I, could you please repeat the first part of that? Why does it call community memory in, or instead of what? I couldn't hear that. Yeah. Uh, why was it called community memory, the project, while it was all about communication in the present? What, what, uh -huh. Why memory? Nowadays it's memory, but why was it called memory when it happened? <laughs> because it was memory then. Uh, you could enter an item and categorize it with any index word you, you came up with. You just thought of a word or many words, typed them in, and then it was stored. That's the memory. You didn't have to be synchronous in your communications. You could be asynchronous. Uh, and it was also designed not to carry the content of communication. Uh, we realized that in, in order to have communication with anyone, you have to know who they are. You have to have a, a, a connection to them. You have to be able to convey your message. Then you can go ahead and convey the content of your message. And so, and this is very important, we separated the information into at least two types, primary and secondary. Primary was the content of the communication, what you wanted to say. Secondary was uh, who you wanted to say it to. And very often you did not know who that, what that name was. In fact, if you did know the name, you could pick up the telephone and call them. So this was more like a directory uh, so of people with interests that you were interested in and the ability to, you had the ability to uh, search for this. So there's where the memory comes in. Uh, and I, Ivan Illich, I finally met him in the 1980s and was introduced to him as someone who had helped make this uh, community memory system based on his ideas. And he's a very, well, he's dead now, but, but then he was a very funny man. Uh, very strange. He kept sh holding my hand that I had been shaking. You know, I shook his hand and he didn't let go. And he kept saying, he, well, he started to say, Lee, why do you uh, put a computer between people and go deet, 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 deet to communicate? Why don't you just, for instance, go over there and talk with, with Pearl if you want to talk with her? And I let him talk and then I finally said, what if you did not know that it was Pearl that you wanted to talk to? And he thought about that for a moment. He said, I see what you mean. Now, he had been talking as, uh, about the concept of a bicycle society. And I said, so you see, possibly a bicycle society needs a computer. Uh, and I might have changed his thinking a tiny bit in that regard, which, for which I'm very proud. Uh, second part of the question uh, about a uh, master-slave relationship. I think the question says it all. Uh, we were uh, people, young people who were discovering that we had a place in a master-slave relationship, not necessarily as the master. And, uh, you know, we were brought up to think that we would go to university and it would be a delightful environment. Everything would be done for us except the studying. And now we found that when we decided to step outside that university into the real world and participate in uh, the social struggles that were underway, that this benevolent university administration suddenly turned much less benevolent that discovery changed a whole lot of minds. And the master-slave relationship that was built into the mainframe structure of computer use uh, was something that was corrosive 
to both parties. This is the point that uh, Ivan Illich makes in Tools for Conviviality. Uh, you may say, well, I'm the master of the technology. But you aren't really, because you have to do things the way the technology is laid out. And so you do have less freedom than you think you have, which is always a dangerous situation. Um, and participating, as he would say, and he, Illich is a Catholic uh, philosopher. He, in fact, he used to be a rising star in the Jesuits, and he got out of that. Uh, participating in a master-slave relationship, he maintains, is destructive to whoever is involved. Um, I, as an engineer, I have to be involved in hierarchical processes, uh, so I can't just simply uh, opt out of that. But again, I don't, hardly need to explain, expand at all on your question. The question says it has its own answer contained within it. Any other questions? So, All right. I don't think there are right now questions. So, um, as I said, if you like, you can join us at uh, half past nine there in the second floor at the Signal Laboratory, and we could have a chat with the cousin Stein then. Um, right now, I have to thank you for your talk, and if you like, you're invited to Berlin perhaps next year, the, the year after, or let's see. Okay. Ne next year in Berlin. I just want to bring in a phrase from Leonard Cohen. Uh -huh. First we take Manhattan, <laughs> then we take Berlin. Yeah.